Hola, everybody. Bienvenidos. Welcome to En Casa con la Plaza. I'm Abelardo de la Peña Jr., Director of Marketing and Communications with La Plaza de Cultura y Arte, welcoming you to our virtual programming, which are presentations, conversations, demonstrations, and performances three, sometimes four times per week, sometimes even more. Mm -hmm. It's our way of fulfilling our mission of honoring the past, inspiring the future, and recognizing the enduring cultural influence of Mexicans, Mexican Americans, and all Latinas and Latinos in Los Angeles through transformative exhibitions, programming, and educational experiences. And we're, here we're gonna have an educational and an entertaining experience. If you're on Zoom, please use our comments section to let us know where you're viewing from. Use the Q&A feature to ask questions. We'll probably take them after the performance, after the presentation. If you're on Facebook, please make comments, ask questions. We have that comment section for you to let us know where you're viewing from. Start a watch party, share the fun, share the entertainment. Again, let us know where you're viewing from. I'm viewing from South Pasadena and our guest is viewing or zooming in from Long South. Beach, California. Mm -hmm. So let me present to you Dr. Gloria Arjona, born in El Paso, raised in Mexico City, she has a distinctive way of lecturing through music, stories, media, traditional attire, and living pictures to draw attention on the rich cultures and traditions of Latino America, and particularly Mexico and the US-Mexico border, either as a soloist or an accompanist or accompanied by guest musicians, Dr. Arjona will create a dynamic environment of learning and joy for young children and adults and of course, Gloria is no stranger to En Casa Con La Plaza. One of our first sessions was on Loteria back in May, back May 8th. And then again, she came and visited us uh, with a presentation of her book, Posadas Literary Calaveras. So please join us, Dr. Gloria Arjona. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abelardo. And thank you all of you who are uh, joining us uh, to this educative, and as Abelardo said, entertaining, I guess, <laughs> uh, programs. Uh, first of all, I want to recognize and to, to give thanks uh, to La Plaza, I mean, La Plaza de la Cultura y Artes, and specifically to the program in Casa con la Plaza for uh, creating these important uh, programs. I have been uh, watching some of the programs and they vary really from musical programs, uh, politics, uh, history, and health. So I, I really uh, want to acknowledge publicly what you are doing, uh, Abelardo, and all the staff at uh, Plaza, La Plaza de la Cultura y las Artes. Well, you're, you're welcome. It's, it's our pleasure and it's our honor to have you and all the other guests that have appeared on uh, this, our 99th episode. So please uh, take it over, take it away, please, Dr. Arjona. Yes, thank you very much. So I'm going to share uh, my PowerPoint uh, because this is the beauty of this new form <laughs> that we have a, a, we can have a perfect pre presentation. Okay, so the, the program I am presenting tonight is um, the Soldaderas, uh, delves into the women that participated in the 1910 Mexican Revolution, the most important social uh, movement uh, of Mexico of the 20th century, and the revolution that set the example for other revolutions in Latin America. So the Mexican Revolution is definitely one of the most important uh, revolutions not only for Mexico but for uh, Latin America is so important that in literature there is a genre, un género devoted only specifically to the Mexican uh, to the Mexican Revolution literature, la literatura de la Revolución Mexicana. I will be uh, going from Spanish to English, okay? <laughs> a little bit uh, of both languages, uh, bilingual program. Uh, uh, those of you who have seen my programs know that um, I always go 
to those aspects of history that uh, had not been told or that had not been uh, had been misrepresented. In this case, I am referring to Las Soldaderas uh, that in, in commonly in the history books, we don't see uh, enough information of those brave women that participated in the Mexican Revolution, not only in the battlefield, but uh, cooking, as nurses, uh, as journalists, as teachers, in all the periods of the Mexican Revolution, women were there. And despite of that fact, uh, in, in the history, the official story do not recognize uh, their importance. How do we know about Las Soldaderas? Well, we know about them because of the many pictures that exist, because as some of you might know, uh, the photojournalism in Latin America was born with the Mexican Revolution. So the Mexican Revolution is one of the most filmed and most photographed revolutions in all the world. So because of these pictures, and you can see right here, I am presenting the, the cover of my album that I, I am also presenting tonight. Um, we have those, the, the evidence, the pictures evidence, the presence of these women in all the facets, in todas las facetas. And also we know about their participation because of the corridos the revolutionary ballots or the ballots that uh, had many functions. And one of them was to tell the news from one place to another. And also another, another purpose of the, the corridos was to highlight the deeds of the heroes and also of the women heroes. So we know about these women because of the pictures and because of the corridos. Unfortunately, the corridos and many that I am presenting and singing today, tonight, uh, also have uh, the, the view of the male, a male gaze, una mirada masculina, okay? So these corridos highlight uh, characteristics that are uh, important mainly for, for men, like for example, the beauty of the soldaderas or their loyalty. So that's why some feminists <laughs> don't like the corridos. But what I am doing, what I'm doing in this album that I just released and that is devoted to the soldaderas is that I in, uh, included texts of a writer that I admire a lot Elena Poinatowska. So actually the album and the program that I am presenting tonight is a combination of uh, ballads, corridos, and uh, texts mainly uh, taken from Elena Poniatowska, Las Soldaderas, because she's a Mexican writer that uh, has written extensively on the Soldaderas. So, <clears throat> What I'm going to do right now, I'm going to start, let me, let me share one more, uh, a couple of more uh, images before going to the first uh, song. Uh, this is one of the pictures that I am referring when I say that women were always present. But notice that whereas the horses were reserved for men, women, most women would be walking behind the soldados, behind the soldiers, behind the revolucionarios, carrying, as Elena Poniatowska says, and again, as I include in the, in the album, carrying practically their houses on their backs, because as you can see in this uh, picture, 
these uh, women were carrying canastas, baskets with the, the food for the soldiers, okay? Many of these women would be carrying the, the metate to make the tortillas, a stone, a stone, um, a stone wood um, tool used in Mexican cuisine, a traditional Mexican cuisine to make tortillas, the molcajete to make the salsa. And those are tools, very heavy tools, and they would be carrying those, okay? So these women, even if some women did not participate in the battlefield, they also should be called soldaderas. I agree with Elena Poniatowska when she say, those were soldaderas too, Th those were soldiers too. Um, but unfortunately, men uh, and their comadre, co compañeros, the comrades, not always recognize their contribution. We see in these pictures that women are either walking or traveling on top of the trains. Why? Because the wagons were reserved for the horses. That means that horses were more important than women. At least that's why they believe. It was a, a, a contradiction because they knew that women were very important, but they, um, they didn't give them their place. And I'm telling you that they knew that women were important because when the soldiers, either from the federales or the revolucionarios, which are the two opposite um, uh, uh, teams here, uh, arrived to a little town, the families will uh, keep away the, the women, will hide their women because women were valuable, not only uh, for uh, sexual uh, purposes, but also because women were practically uh, in many ways the servants of, of, the, in, in the, of the soldados. In fact, the word soldada, soldadera comes the rise from soldada, which originally refer to a woman that would do several errands for a soldier, um, generally a male soldier, and uh, who, who would go and, and get the money of the soldier. The, that money was called soldada, and that derived in the, in the word soldadera. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, and many other words that originally were pejorative uh, names the, to refer to these brave women. I will start the first song, which is actually the first track of my album. Uh, it's a corrido, all of them, most of them are corridos. Uh, it's called Corridos de las Soldaderas that I edited because I wanted to highlight the participation of uh, the women. So you will hear that corrido, that beautiful corrido. Most of the corridos are uh, belong from, are of the public dominion. That means that uh, they were not created for a single author, but uh, by a community and they were passed from, from, from mouth to mouth and uh, people would keep changing some stanzas and adapting the corridos. And that's the story for, for most of the corridos we are presenting uh, today. That's why sometimes they, they look like disconnected, okay? Um, so I'm going to start with that corrido. And along, as you hear that corrido, you will see many of the pictures of the soldadera. Some of them do not have very good resolution because I mean, eh, some of them do, eh, mainly the ones that belong to the Casasola archives, which is a very eh, well-known um, archive of pictures of mainly of the Mexican Revolution. Those have a high resolution, but many won't have a high resolution. But you will, those of you who are not familiar with La Soldadera, you will see all these women of different races, uh, of different colors of skin, of different ages participating in the revolution.
cuidando a sus muchachos Sin miedo a que una bala les partiera el corazón Usaban colorete, bailaban de cachete Era luz y alegría en la revolución Sabían montar en ancas, luciendo en aguas blancas Eran lindas marietas, como dice la canción Madre soldadera, que allá por la trinchera cantó la Jesucita, las pelonas y el marzón. Sus manos alimento de todo el regimiento, con mano de sargento y de firme convicción. Jugaba la muñeca, gallina y pata chueca, no hacía ninguna mueca al rugido del cañón. I didn't include the complete corrido because they are a little bit long, okay? But you got an idea of, uh, of this music, those of you who are not familiar again. Um, let me go to some other pictures. Um, something that calls my attention, um, and, and I have said this uh, before, uh, are the many children that appear in these pictures because these soldaderas, as uh, those of you who understand the Spanish, uh, the, the singer is, um, is, is singing from the point of view of a daughter of a soldadera. So the person that is singing the corrido, the, the one that I just uh, presented, uh, is recalling how her soldadera mother used to protect her under her skirt, okay? And how she was used to all the Uh, rifles and, and to continue playing. So that really made me think about these children and how the mother of these children, how these soldaderas really, because they were actually soldaderas, uh, they would keep a family in the middle of the war. Usually people ask me how many people die during the Mexican Revolution. And that's an, an, an amount that uh, varies, okay, that we do not have an exact uh, number, but uh, some historians say that more than one million people die. And uh, others say that probably two million people. So, so the numbers vary because there is no way to, to measure Uh, all the impact of this war that lasted uh, almost 10 years. Uh, so, so I imagine uh, these women playing with the children, keeping the house, uh, cooking, cooking with whatever they had at hand, because we, again, they were in the middle of nowhere. And uh, acting also as nurses. Uh, these soldaderas, uh, this, this, uh, these are the women. I feel really very um, emotional when, when I see these, these pictures and when I connect the music to these pictures, then uh, a whole picture uh, is a, a complete picture. Look, look at this one, which is uh, beautiful, really. Here we have a group of women And this is taken from the uh, uh, Casasola archive. And these women are cooking. And you can see, I was talking about the metates. So they were carrying their metates, this stone to make the, the tortillas. It's called, in, in, in English, it's called the, um, I don't remember exactly how it's, how it's called this, this tool to make tortillas, but they are heavy, really. And the molcajete, which are a little bit uh, lighter, but still heavy. And we see complete families. And this is another uh, important point that, again, Elena Poyatowska explains in, in her book, in, in her many books devoted to soldaderas, uh, that she says she compares the Mexican Revolution with the, with the social uh, war, la guerra social española in Spain, 
okay? The 1936 to 1939 uh, civil war uh, of Spain. And she says how it was different in many ways. And one of the important differences is that whereas in the civil war, uh, the soldiers at night had to look for a refugee and have to look for food and have to look for, for, for comfort, emotional comfort. Mexican soldiers, the revolucionarios, they had all that. Why? Because these loyal women, mothers, sisters, uh, girlfriends, they would be following their men, okay? So this is one kind of soldaderas. Uh, and I agree totally with Elena Poniatowska, without the soldaderas, simply there's no Mexican revolution. And still they receive uh, mistreatment. They were subject of sexual harassment. They were subject of discrimination because many men, many soldiers were offended to have women soldiers fighting along with them. With them. They were okay, and one of them was Pancho Villa, and we admire Pancho Villa in many ways, but uh, Pancho Villa did not admit women in his army. They could be uh, nurses and of course uh, lovers, okay, we know that but uh, he didn't want uh, viejas, as, they, as he used to say, in his army as soldiers. So these women had to endure all that. And still they receive a mistreatment and there are many pejorative names that uh, male soldiers refer to uh, useful to refer to las soldaderas. And one of them, as I said before, was the term soldadera. Soldadera, that it was an equivalent of a servant, okay? So I imagine that many of the, of the actual women soldiers, the ones that took the arms and were in the battlefield, they were uh, classified only as soldaderas as servants, okay. Other names, and I have, um, I have right here other name, are cooking ladies, cocineras, captain's pets, chismosas, troublemakers, juanas, slots, cucarachas, and of course, soldaderas, an offensive name back then, but not today. Today, the word soldadera connotes resistance, okay. The next song is actually the only one that is not a corrido. It's a, it's a song uh, composed by um, Jesus Rodriguez uh, and, and her girlfriend, I forgot the, the name right now, but it's called Las Soldaderas. And the important thing that I wanted to highlight is uh, Liliana Felipe and Jesus Rodriguez. Those, those are the composers of the next song. And uh, what is important is that they composed this song based in a text, in this text, in this book of Elena Poniatowska. And the leitmotif, the most important idea of this song is that without the soldaderas, there's no Mexican revolution and still they receive pejorative names. So it's everything that I have been telling you about Las Soldaderas. Viudas, solteras, amantes y casadas, madres y hermanas formaron batallón. Al mando de fornidas tortillera, las soldaderas se fueron al montón. Al mando de fornidas tortillera, las soldaderas se fueron al montón. A las mujeres robadas y violadas No hubo de otra que unirse al batallón Pero también las hubo enamoradas Que tras su amor se fueron a la bola Pero también las hubo enamoradas Que tras su Juan se fueron a la bola Carmen Larrones, Florina Lazos María Quinteras y Petra Ruiz Ángela Gómez, la Bobadilla y Carmen Parra, la de Alanis.
Cade te clara, la Catalina, la Carmen Vélez, mi encarnación. María Esperanza, la Petra Herrera, la Valentina y también yo. Sin soldaderas no habría revolución. Sin soldaderas no habría revolución. Sorry. I have to make the disclaimer that uh, it's because of the contingency, because we cannot uh, regularly meet with other musicians, the three uh, of us live in our house. It's my husband, Javier, uh, my son, <laughs> he's not my son, but he's my adoptive son, Lucio Vieira, and, and myself, and we recorded some voices before, and then on, on top of those voices, I recorded my voice, okay? So we have to do many tricks with technology in order to have something decent to present in this book, in, in this, in this um, album, no book, okay? <laughs> well, uh, usually when we think about the soldaderas, uh, of course, it comes to our minds, uh, the La Doña, why? Because Maria Felix, she has uh, played uh, the role of various soldaderas, la cucaracha, la valentina, many of the names that you heard uh, of those uh, important soldaderas have been uh, taken to the, to the cinema, to the film, an important cinema, good movies by La Doña. And, and that's another aspect that uh, Elena Ponetowska criticizes, uh, and I agree with her, because she says the soldaderas were not like Maria Felix. I mean, it's not uh, the, the, soldadera, the, the soldaderas, Elena, Elena Ponetowska puts it, puts it in, in other terms. The soldaderas were not as voluptuous, tan voluptuosas, as Maria Felix or, or Silvia Pinal, okay, those uh, actresses that have played the role of soldaderas, but they were rather tiny, dark skin, uh, apparently fragile women. And I say apparently because of course, they show an enormous strength. So these are the actual soldaderas, okay. The soldaderas had to develop a way to, to many of them were dressed as, as men. Uh, many of them passed as men. And this is the case of La Valentina, okay. Why did she decide to pass as men? We, we believe that this is the, the famous Valentina, uh, there is a popular corrido for those of you who are not familiar with the corridos of the revol revolucionarias. There is uh, one of them that is called La Valentina. And, uh, and we believe that La Valentina, this is a picture of Valentina Ramirez Avitia. Why was she dressed as a guy, as a, as a person, well, as a male? Well, because as I say before, there was a lot of sexual harassment. So many of these women passed as men. La Valentina, she changed her name uh, and her identity to avoid sexual harassment. And as you can see, she was very, very young. So again, this is a hypothesis, a highly, uh, highly believed hypothesis, but still is, is not in 100% secure that she was La Valentina. And I also have La, la Adelita. Uh, so some of you might be uh, surprised because when you think in the soldaderas, again, we think in those images uh, associated with, uh, Maria Felix or, or those images that we see in the calendars of these uh, women, very 
strong and, and tall. And, uh, and then we have these tiny, uh, very young women and many soldaderas were like La Valentina, like Valentina Ramirez Aditya. So what I did in this album, and I want to share with you another thing that I, that I did and, and that I consider that um, is unique in the way that I, I did not see in, in other work is that instead of referring to uh, La Valentina as a third person woman, I created some monologues that, uh, that in which she, in this case, explain uh, or tells a little bit of her biography from her perspective, okay? So my, my purpose, again, in creating these mono, monologues, these monologues was uh, to, to have, to at least try to have their own perspective, number one, and also to humanize these, uh, these women. Because when we really listen to their stories, we find that they did very, very uh, defiant things. So I won't tell you no more about La Valentina. I will uh, allow her to explain in her own words. What you will see is a representation. I was telling Abelardo that I am amazed with, with our community, how willing to participate and how good ideas uh, do they have and how they get involved in this theme of the Mexican Revolution? Because I have I have seen that it's a theme that we really uh, feel um, our we 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 have in our in our, in our family all of us have a a tío or abuelo that was a revolutionario. Okay, so we have we grew up with those stories. Uh, so when I decided to, to do something um, a couple of months ago with, uh, with a group of artists, uh, we invited um, an, an artist, um, Alejandra Hernandez, and she represented La Valentina. I gave her the monologue, but she came with uh, great ideas. Uh, it was in Spanish, so what I did, you will see her representation, but you will see my voice uh, over uh, her representation in English, uh, because I assume that not everybody would uh, understand uh, Spanish tonight. Okay, so you will hear a little bit more of La Valentina. Yo soy la menta Valentina Ramirez Avitia. My name is Valentina Ramirez. I was born in 1893 in a little village near El Norotal in Sinaloa. Because of this and my violent nature, they call me La Leona de Norotal, the Lioness of Norotal. I joined La Bola to follow my father. It was 1910 when Francisco y Madero called to action to end the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, who had been ruling the country for 33 years, making the rich richer and the poor poorer. My father communicated to the family his desire to fight for the freedom of our compatriotas. I told him that I would accompany him. I was 17 years old, but I already knew that I wanted to fight along with my father against la dictadura my father was killed almost immediately. I decided to keep fighting, but dressed as a man and with a male identity, I became Juan Ramirez. I did this because my father was not there anymore to protect me, and we revolutionary women were considered easy women, yearning to sleep with anyone. Many soldiers believe that we were there to have a good time. They didn't imagine that we could also have ideas and desire to change our unfair society in which just a few hacendados owned most of our land. In 1911, dressed as a man, 
carrying a carabina 30-30, cananas full of bullets crossing my chest, and a palm hat to hide my braids, I took Plaza de Culiacán, winning the victory for the revolucionarios and earning the rank of lieutenant. There is a famous corrido I inspired that states that my lover surrendered at my feet and overcome with passion proclaimed that if he will die tomorrow, he would die today as well. But songs are one thing and reality another. When the revolution was over, leaders shared land and recognition among themselves and many, particularly women, did not receive any compensation. Others, like me, received a meager pension, only enough to buy some tortillas. Una pasión me domina y es la que me hizo venir Valentina Valentina yo te quisiera decir dicen que por tus amores sea el diablo yo también me sé si es porque hoy tomo tequila mañana tomo jerez si es porque hoy me ven borracho mañana ya no me Mañana que me maten de una vez So as you could see, corridos are one thing and the reality was another. And La Valentina, eh, she died in very, very poor condition as many other soldaderas because they were not recognized even if, as in her case, she uh, achieved high awards during the war. Uh, so so that, that's what I wanted to, to, to dialogue the corridos. I love the corridos. We all love the corridos. But again, they just present one view that is not necessarily the view of the soldaderas. And if we wanted to honor the soldaderas, then we have to give a more complete picture. Uh, so that's why she explained who she was and why was uh, she in the war and why was she uh, disguised as a, a male soldier. The most popular soldadera is La Adelita. And again, some of you will be surprised to associate the corrido with this picture that again, we believe uh, belongs to the Adelita. Because what we have is like, uh, we have a lot of pictures and we have a lot of uh, anecdotes and corridos and uh, what the historians have been doing, some of them, and one of them is uh, Elena Poetowska, although she's not a historian, but she has been researching and studying and writing about uh, the soldaderas, is to connect those pictures with the corrido or the legend, okay? Uh, so we believe that this is a picture of La Adelita. And La Adelita, as I mentioned before, is the most popular uh, corrido. It's so popular that Adelitas y Soldaderas are two words used uh, indistinctly. 
okay? like a, as a synonyms, Abelitas or Soldaderas. Who was La Abelita? Uh, Adela Velarde, she was a very young girl, as you can see. She was almost a child when she decided to join the soldiers. Uh, she was 13 years old. She was from Chihuahua. And uh, it is believed that she belonged to a middle class uh, family, or, or at least no middle class because there was not a lot of middle class during those times. That, that's why we had a revolution. But uh, she had some means and she had access to some education. But when she heard about La Revolución, she decided to join eh, La Bola, as they say. Now, you will hear, hear again her story in her own words, what is important to her, or what at least I believe is important to her as from a woman of color perspective. And then you will hear the corrido, a beautiful corrido that mainly highlights what her beauty and her loyalty to the sergeant or, or one of or the soldiers. Okay, so the, La Delita was uh, another uh, representation uh, we did with uh, with another great uh, performer, uh, Unibrioso. So this is La Delita. Adela Velarde. Nací en Chihuahua en 1900. I am La Delita. I was born on September 8, 1900 in Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua. Since my parents were not as poor as most around me, I was able to study elementary school. A rare thing for the women of my time and my social class who were raised to worry only to be beautiful and learn all kinds of chores to get a good catch. But those ideas were not mine, and the revolution allowed me to do what I was passionate about, caring for the sick. Of course, I could not be a doctor. We were in the middle of the revolution, and at that time, it was unthinkable of a woman to be a physician. Un America, they say today, but that word did not even exist back then. I became a nurse for the White Cross. I was only 13 years old when, disobeying my parents, I joined a Division del Norte and served Chihuahua, Zacatecas, Torreón. I went all the way to Mexico City and Morelos. A popular corrido bearing my name states that I was madly in love with a surgeon. <laughs> but those are rumors of people who always want to find a romantic relationship in every story. I was in love, but with my mission. I wanted to take care of the wounded. I was not scared of the bullets, and I was fine dealing with blood, vomit, infections, nasty smells and sounds, and even death. If you only knew what we nurses saw during the revolution and the miracles we did with just a few resources. There is much talk also about my beauty, but it was not so. How can you be beautiful in the middle of the war? If men and women admire me, it was because I was myself. I was restless, cheerful, curious, and above all, independent. As all the soldaderas, I was subject of sexual harassment, so I became very defiant and aggressive to protect myself. And yes, 
men ended up respecting me. So that was La Delita. I know the, the volume was a little bit uh, low. And um, I want to, I have two more slides and then I want to leave some, some time. I see that there are some questions and comments and I love that part. Uh, again, all the music you are listening tonight uh, comes in this album that I just released last week. Is so that's her stories from the fields. I don't know why her stories, because I am, I try to put in their own words, from their own perspective, their stories. Uh, one of the most captivating stories that I'm going to present right now is uh, the one of Colonel Amelio Robles. Uh, we have a few pictures of these amazing soldaderas that is the first officially trans person, transgender person of uh, this side of the world, okay? I'm not saying that she is the first or, or he because uh, she became he. I'm not saying that he is the first uh, transgender person, but I am saying the first transgender person officially recognized and not only recognized by the Mexican government, but also recognized by the church. Again, many of the things we are saying tonight, many of the facts of uh, around las, las Adelitas, Las Soldaderas are easy to say, but when you consider like in the previous uh, performance, like in the previous Soldadera, La Adelita, she was only 13 years old when she joined the revolution. And in this case, we have the first transgender person officially recognized and 
allowed to be married by the Catholic Church is really something. It's something that I personally feel very proud that this happened in Mexico during a period of time of many changes. So right here we have uh, the picture of La Coronela or Colonel Amelio Robles. Uh, rather, I have to correct myself, El Coronel, no La Coronela, El Coronel Amelio Robles. Uh, and as I did in the other stories, I will let him to, uh, to tell you a little bit of his story. Oh, I wanted to point out because this is a, a picture that I have always uh, felt captivated uh, towards because not only she is a soldadera, I am referring to the person on the right, but she is a mulata. And uh, those of you who know me uh, know my passion for another great team that is the African heritage in Mexico. So right here we have a soldaderas and in the many pictures of the soldaderas, I'm sure you saw many, what we would call today Afro descendants, Afro Mexicans rather. Uh, and, and I uh, put it the, her picture here because she is frequently uh, mixed, uh, confused with um, Amelio Robles because it is believed that she had, she was also from the same place, which is Guerrero, and also uh, they had the last name, the, the last name was Robles, both of them, but they are completely different persons, okay? Uh, she, she was not a, a trans, a not, a, a, not that, I, that we know, she was rather one of those soldiers. And identity, and that was not the case with Amelio Robles. I was born Amelia Robles Avila, but thanks to the revolution, I became Amelio. I can proudly say that I am the first transgender soldadera in Latin America. I was born in 1889 in Sichipala, Guerrero, in a middle-class family. I attended Catholic school, and by the age of 12, I was well-trained in all the chores expected from a good girl. Embroidering, knitting, sewing, cooking. But that girl was not me. I did not even perceive myself as a woman. So when I heard, I didn't think it twice and joined the revolutionaries. My parents. I was a womanizer. I was skillful with guns and horses. When the revolution was over, I was married by the Catholic Church and my wife and I adopted a child. I was recognized as a male veteran of the Mexican Revolution by the Ministry of War. Well, as you could see, I even had to, to act, okay? So again, this uh, pandemic uh, has something positive is I, I assume that for many of us uh, have has make us do things that we, we would never <laughs> do under other uh, conditions. Uh, but I believe that, that that's uh, part of, uh, in my case, I, I owe a lot to, to this excellent 
role models that I grew up with. So they were a, a model to develop resilience. So just imagine what they had to endure during those times, uh, these women within the revolutionarios and uh, with the common enemies. I'll end just presenting Lucha Reyes, La Tequilera. Uh, I have the song, but I, I won't, I don't have it here, but it's in the album. It's a beautiful song. Uh, Lucha Reyes was the daughter of a soldadera. And uh, Lucha Reyes is uh, recognized as the first woman, the first woman, I'm sorry, that uh, dared to sing uh, music songs that were considered manly songs, okay? So she developed the, the or oh, she invented the estilo bravío de la canción ranchera. And with Lucha Reyes, I end and I open the space for any comments that you might have. And again, I thank for your, for your attention and I thank Abelardo for, for the opening the space to share uh, with the audience this, this work that I feel passionate about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gloria. And, and your passion really comes through uh, in the performances, in the in the words that you were saying, in the songs, especially in the and the acting. As you say, many of us have had to take on roles that we never imagined before, as as have I. Uh, but but here we are. Uh, but, but really, thank you for for really uh, you know by demythologizing the the soldaderas, you you humanize them, and and uh, in order for them to gain the respect and acknowledgement they really deserve. And in fact, you made them even more heroic, I think, than than the way that they're portrayed in the songs. So, 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 thank you for that. We we have a couple questions here uh, from Alberto Juarez. Did soldaderas serve all warring factions in the Revolución? All the what? The warring factions. Did they take? What, what? I know that you spoke of the different roles that they played, but as far as the the actual fighting, did they participate in that as well? Yeah, in the actual fighting, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Th those those women, like for example, if you if you listen to the stories of uh, La Valentina, uh, she was a soldier, and she she even achieved a, a, a higher rank. Okay, because uh, as she explains. She, with a, with a few soldiers, she won uh, a plaza of, of the, the Coahuila, okay? So yes, there are several uh, several uh, ways of uh, being a soldier. I started with uh, the, what would be the housewives, okay? The, the women that follow the soldados, but of course, they, they, there were also La Valentina and Amelio Robles, they were soldados, okay? La Adelita, she was a nurse, but still you see her in the pictures carrying cananas and, and pieces, so they have to be on, on the front also. All right, uh, from Ricardo yes, Hernandez. Thank you for, for your answer, I hope I... Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, from, oh, Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo. Hi, Ricardo. Yeah, Ricardo is for... asking, first of all, great lecture, Dr. Gloria Arjona. Uh, my question is, uh, when Mexican uh, revolutionarios like Emiliano Zapata, Carranza, and so on, uh, when they were, uh, when they overthrew the dictator Porfirio Diaz, were soldaderas able to obtain their own revolution uh, of freedom and self-determination? Uh, I, I think I believe uh, that this was just a, a step. No, I mean, uh, it opened definitely the Mexican Revolution opened the space for for men and women, but for many women and, and for and for people with different um, uh, is, is how to say for, for people with with different uh, inclinations, if I can say that word, I mean, uh, because as we say with El Coronel Amelio Robles, okay, uh, 
uh, he participated in the Mexican Revolution, as he says, because it was an opportunity to get out of, 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 of her family, of, of, of his family, and become what he really felt he was. So definitely the Mexican Revolution, thank you, Ricardo, for, for asking that, is a big step in uh, women, but uh, women, uh, we are celebrating this uh, year, the, um, the suffrage of the women's suffrage in the United States that was a, a hundred years ago. Uh, Mexican women could not vote until I believe it was, uh, I don't want to say the 1950, early 1950s or so they did not win immediately the vote, but they win a little bit of, um, of a space they were able. And as we saw in Lucha Reyes, of course I was very fast, but she was a, a, the first woman to go uh, to those places that were considered places not appropriate for women and started to sing music that was not considered inappropriate for these same women. So it brought, Ricardo, uh, as you as you pointed, it brought a lot of uh, changes, good changes for women. All right, uh, a question from Maricela Campos. Uh, can you share the name of your album again, please? And and where can yes. uh, any uh, when, where can we purchase it? Oh, everywhere. Oh, I have my web uh, site now, which is uh, www. Oh, yes, yes, it's by English. It's by GloriaArjona.com. Okay, uh, I am also on Facebook. I am very active in the social media. And, and I can, if you send me a message, I can gladly give you the information, but it's in Amazon and iTunes and, and, and all the electronic platforms. And it's called Soldaderas, Her Stories from the Fields. And I really, really think uh, that is a beautiful work. As I say, it um, combines texts of Elena Poniatowska with the songs that you heard. So I try to really, create the stories that I hope uh, I, I was able to, to share with you tonight uh, here in the album. Well, thank you thank so you much, Gloria. And, th and thank you to the viewers that tuned in uh, tonight. Maria Vega from Bell, uh, Jimena Martin, uh, Saludos the Mid-City, Elizabeth Vega viewing Saludos. from Tucson, Arizona. Oh, wow. Gracias, I thank love you. the history of our culture. Uh, oh, yeah. Patty Orepesa from Downey, Abril Magaña from La Puente, Jaslo from Huntington Park, Margaret Equihua from Her Hermosa Beach, Lydia de los Rios from Claremont, and again, Sandra Contreras, thank you for a beautiful, beautiful presentation. And Anabel Gutierrez Arteaga, excelente presentación Gracias. de la historia mexicana. Felicidades, Dr. Gloria, and Maritza, how Getty Mendizabal saying soldaderas were very strong women fighting with their men during the revolution. And you made it very clear that they were, sometimes they even exceeded the bravery of the men because yes. they not only had to, uh, you know, fight, but also had to fight for themselves as, as women. So, so any last words, uh, uh, Dr. Gloria Arjona? Well, uh, I, I think uh, as, as somebody said, uh, the, the history is uh, beautiful. Uh, history, uh, we, we love, in general, we love our history. Uh, 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 Mexicans, and I, and I believe uh, Latin Americans, we love our history, I mean, uh, but I believe that there are many chapters in history that we have to revisit with another perspective, okay? Mainly a uh, gender and racial perspective. So I believe there is a lot, a lot of things that we can still do and, and find uh, from another view, okay? So, so that's what I am trying to do. And now that we have uh, more time than usual, so we don't have any excuse. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's right. Oh, a question that just came in oh, from Indira Jimenez. Why do you think people, the, the, the people that were photographed would allow themselves to be pho uh, photographed? Or, or pose for it? Was it was it staged? Oh, that's another that, that's another very very interesting thing. Okay, <laughs> um, film and photograph were barely developing uh, at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century. 
So many uh, in film, I know that many American companies would go and film the actual war. Many of the wars of Pancho Villa were uh, filmed. And uh, why did they allow? Well, simply because they would receive, uh, Pancho Villa would receive money to allow uh, those uh, filmmakers to film. And, he, and they say that he would even change the time of, the, of, the, of a war because of the light, uh, they, they needed good light for filming. So that's a very good question because there are uh, pictures of actual soldaderas and soldiers in the battlefield, like a, and there are others that they were just dressed as soldaderas because again, uh, there were a lot of people, many Americans, American photographs uh, uh, will go to Mexico. And we know that later on after the revolution, we know in the times of Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo, eh, we know that many artists from the United States and other places of Europe and many photographers went to Mexico to, uh, to photograph. So uh, I don't know, I hope, I hope they receive a little money for allowing them to, to <laughs> photograph. Or oh, some people would not even care. I mean, wh what is that for, okay? Sure. It was so different back then, yes. All right, well, thank you again. And for uh, all of you viewers, uh, if you came in late, uh, we did, of course, record, or if you want to view it again, we recorded this session with Dr. Gloria Arjona, and it'll be on our YouTube page at La Plaza LA, on our website at lapca.org, and also it'll live on our Facebook page as well. Uh, this, along with uh, uh, Gloria's other uh, presentations on the uh, Loteria, in which I think we, we, I think we did the first online Loteria game yes. with, uh, with yes. about 100 other other people viewing in, and then that was back in May, and then Posadas Literary, Literary Calaveras uh, back in August. And you could view all of our sessions, our presentations, our, our La Cocina, uh, uh -huh. uh, cooking demonstrations and so on uh, at, on our website and on our uh, YouTube page and on our Facebook page. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, uh, PepsiCo, SoCal Gas, California Humanities, Thanks to our, uh, our staff at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. You could view our upcoming programs. We have them scheduled until the end of uh, mid, mid of this month into next week. We'll be taking a couple of weeks off and we'll be starting again in January. But uh, coming up this Friday, uh, Virtual Cultura in Casa con la Plaza's 100th session. So it'll be uh, some fun and, insightful uh, fun and insightful backward look at our virtual program with uh, Kind of like the best of and for sure we will be including uh dr arjona um and with that muchas gracias gloria thank you de nada a ti okay right. thank you everybody and continue excellent programs okay All right. well, well <laughs> thank, thank you. you so much to everybody buenas noches a todos nos vemos muy pronto bye bye, bye.